Thank you, Alison. And thank you, Nicholas. It was very complimentary talk indeed. It was almost as if we planned it. <laughs> um, Nicholas's talk was heavy on facts. Mine's going to be heavy on rhetoric. Um, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri people, of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. There can be no meaningful talk of inequality in this country without acknowledging and discussing the profound inequality between Indigenous Australians and most of the rest of the population. I'm not only talking about economic inequality. Indigenous child mortality is still double that of the non-Indigenous population. And there are too many other damning statistics to rehearse them all here today. Despite being an economist myself, I think it's fair to say that pretty much every important economic question has a political answer. There are, however, a lot of economists out there who would deny this. They believe that economics is a hard science, like physics or chemistry, with laws and immutable facts. This couldn't be further from the truth. The economy is a social construct, and economics is, therefore, a social science. This means that economics is inherently political. As a social science, economics is not something you can really understand by studying the present. Just as it's inherently political, it's also inherently historical. I have always found the most informative voices in economics to be economic historians, because they understand why we do the things we do today. It's become very unfashionable to talk about class and power, but ultimately the story of inequality is a story about class and power. As US billionaire Warren Buffett said, there is a class war and my side is winning. The capitalist class has won the class war so decisively that they've made discussing it seem like wild conspiracy theory. And those who bring it up are accused of the politics of envy. Let's have a quick look at some of the historical trends in Australia before returning to the topic of class and power. The first slide is actually almost identical to one of Nicholas's, which is showing the distribution of uh, income that goes to the top 1% and the top 0.1% in Australia. And all I really wanted you to take away from it is something Nicholas has already shown, which is that, uh, which is that U shaped curve. So we saw uh, in the first part of the 20th century, uh, and at first quite volatile, but then quite steady decline. Here we go, here we go. Uh, decline in inequality measured in, in various different ways. But in this case, uh, the proportion of income going to the top 1% and the top 0.1%. Um, and then along came the 1970s and 1980s and this bottomed out and then reversed as we see today. That's a very rough figure of wealth inequality but the point is just to show the same trend with the same timing which you saw uh, on Nicholas's slides. Here's another uh, slide showing the same time period showing union membership, which you can see during the post-war years was above 50%. Uh, and we hit that same period, the 1970s, the 1980s, and union membership kind of fell off a cliff, which, and it's still declining today. This one is wages as a proportion of GDP. Um, so it shows the share of our economic output that's going to wage earners and the same trend here, we see in the, in the post-war years prior to the 70s and 80s that that was increasing and then it increased quite sharply in the 70s before falling away over the same time period. This one is unemployment in Australia and it's a very, very striking graph I think. Here we obviously we have the Great Depression, obvious enough. World War II, unemployment went to almost zero. And then that post-war boom period, for nearly 25 years, where unemployment averaged about 2%. Then again, we get to the 1970s and 1980s, and unemployment increases dramatically, 
and, and never goes back. And there's no sign of it going back. Policymakers don't even think it's possible to go back at the moment. So, as Nicholas said, this same trend occurred across <laughs> most of the Anglosphere, so most of the English-speaking world, during the same period. So what happened in the 1970s and 80s that changed everything so dramatically? I'm not going to bore you with the story of neoliberalism and the rise of Thatcher, Reagan, and dare I say it here, Keating. We've heard all those stories before, and I think perhaps they were symptoms, not causes. The more interesting story is why this transition occurred at around the same time across the globe. This period of relative prosperity, the post-war boom, 2% unemployment, falling inequality, didn't happen by accident. It was the result of a bipartisan commitment to avoid repeating the conditions that led to the Great Depression. One of the clearest documented indications of this is the Curtin government's 1945 white paper on full employment. An extremely impressive political docu document, at, at least by today's standards, that's recommended reading for anyone interested in Australian politics. The authors and instigators of the 1945 white paper witnessed the Great Depression firsthand. With unemployment averaging nearly 20% and much higher in certain parts of the country and amongst young people, the Depression left an indelible mark on those who lived through it. These policymakers, perhaps foremost among them in Australia, H.C. <coughs> Coombs, then lived through World War II. During the war, the economy was fully employed. Indeed, there was such a shortage of labour that even married women were encouraged to work. Towards the end of the war, Coombs and others, trained in the new economics of John Maynard Keynes, wondered if the government, by stimulating demand, <coughs> can bring about full employment during the wartime, why can't they do it during peacetime? Thus, the white paper was born, and along with it, came 25 years of low unemployment, unemployment, shrinking inequality, rising material standard of living, and strong economic growth, known as the post-war boom. The core of the white paper and related policy was that unemployment resulted from a lack of private demand for labour, and that government could and should use its spending power to maintain full employment during economic downturns. Unemployment was seen as an inherent part of a capitalist market-based system. And if we wanted the positive elements of such a system, then we had to take responsibility for the costs. In other words, unemployment was seen as a collective problem, not an individual failing. By the 1970s, most of the politicians and policy makers and intellectuals who had lived through both the Great Depression and the World War were either retired or dead. Power had shifted to a new cohort of economists trained in a new brand of economics, neoclassical economics. The politicised version of neoclassical, neoclassical economics atomised society into individual workers, consumers and companies and reduced the role of government to the correction of market failures. Government-run enterprises and services were privatised in the name of efficiency, which for the most part was code for cutting services and paying the workers less to make room for profit for business owners. Neoclassical economics did not rise to dominance due to progress within the discipline or due to a better understanding of the economy, but as an intentional response to the reduction in inequality. Here's the important thing. Look at this graph. It shows a falling share of economic output going to the rich, which fought back. They created entire economics departments at prestigious universities, primarily in the US, but not only there. They built a complete and well-championed alternative to Keynesian economics that had dominated since World War II. Then they waited 
for an opportunity to undermine the bipartisan commitment to heavy government intervention in the economy. Finally, in the 1970s, the OPEC-induced oil shocks provided the opening that they had needed to claim that Keynesian economics had failed. Skyrocketing oil prices resulted in high inflation, high unemployment, and floundering economic growth, called stagflation. Traditional Keynesian economics had no response and was successfully painted as a failure. That this crisis had little to do with domestic economic management and was driven by external shocks was lost on most. This con, and it was a con, could only succeed because by the 1970s, most of the policymakers who had lived through the Great Depression had either retired or died. Had Coombs and his colleagues of 1945 still been dominant, neoliberalism, the political sibling of neoclassical economics, would have been dismissed out of hand as the pro-business propaganda that it was. They'd seen this kind of policy making before and it led to the Great Depression. When it came to the unemployed, government policy shifted dramatically from viewing the unemployed as an inevitable consequence of capitalism and, as a result, a collective responsibility to viewing unemployment as an individual failure. A new economic term was coined, a term that only an economist could come up with, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or NIRU. This was the level of unemployment below which labour would have too much power and would be able to demand wage increases above productivity increases. This in turn would cause inflation. It's an entirely theoretical construct, by the way. Nobody really knows what the NIRU is or how to calculate it, but that doesn't stop them assuming a number and acting on it. Don't worry, you don't really need to understand the economics of that to understand that this means we need a large pool of desperate unemployed people clamouring for jobs so that those in employment will be too scared to ask for a pay rise or for better conditions. This wage suppression effect of the unemployed will keep a cap on inflation, so we're told. It will also, conveniently, lead to higher profits. The most powerful bargaining chip that workers have is to walk away. If you're easily replaced and being on the dole is a living hell, then your power as a worker is greatly diminished because your willingness to walk away is eroded. This is what the Nairu is about and it's built into our economic system and into government and reserve bank economic management. There are many more unemployed people than there are jobs. It's not a controversial statement. If every unemployed person was the exemplary job candidate, punctual and immaculately dressed with the perfect CV, the unemployment rate would be exactly what it is today. Unemployment is created by a lack of demand for labour or a skills mismatch, not by the behaviour of the unemployed. So if that's true, why make the unemployed perform all these mutual obligations? Why do they have to constantly jump through all these hoops or face financial penalties? They are made to do this so that the prospect of becoming unemployed will be so frightening to those who are in jobs that they won't push hard for better wages or better conditions. Similarly, the unemployed will be so desperate to get out of the punitive employment services system that they will accept poor wages and poor conditions. In turn, this has been made possible by painting the unemployed as bludgers and parasites on hard-working Australians. Workers have effectively been turned against the unemployed as part of a program of wage suppression. The pattern is the same everywhere, with the modern mantra of gain wealth for getting all but self. We've even privatised our retirement ambitions in the form of superannuation accounts. This atomising of the social contract is absolutely integral to the neoliberal project. 
Unions are among the few remaining barriers to the completion of this project, and their decline is another indicator of how the class war is going. As I said earlier, this is ultimately a story of class and power. Our economic system is a construct, and as such, it can be reconstructed so that it works, for a, works better for a larger proportion of society. The disconnect that has developed between economic output and wages is just one indication that power has shifted too far in favour of the holders of capital and away from workers. There is nothing inevitable about this shift. It's not a product of unstoppable technological progress or of globalisation. These are just narratives designed to disempower. It's a product of the inherent conflict between capital and labour. Those who are winning the class war have tried to change the narrative to say that there is no inherent conflict, that we can work together towards shared goals. While this may be appealing and may be true within individual workplaces, the incentive structure of unregulated capitalism creates inherent conflict between the interests of workers and the interests of the owners of capital. If we're interested in reducing inequality, then we have to be willing to have these conversations and we have to be ready for the inevitable backlash as we are painted as communists, accused of prosecuting the politics of envy and of waging a class war. Perhaps some of you noticed that the, at the beginning of this talk, I said that no serious discussion of inequality can be had without paying attention to indigenous inequality. And here I am, near the end of my rant, having said no more about indige indigenous inequality. Of course, we couldn't do justice to the subject of indigenous disadvantage, even if we spent the entire evening on it. However, in the context of this speech, indigenous policy was perhaps hit hardest by the rise of neoclassical economics. Just as we, as a society, had matured enough to acknowledge indigenous disadvantage, measure it in the census, and begin to make some token steps to acknowledging and addressing 200 years of dispossession and persecution, in came the economics of individualism. This provided the convenient excuse to write off indigenous disadvantage as a result of indigenous failure. As with the modern treatment of the unemployed, this is a complete abdication of responsibility from those with the power to do something about the problems. The profound nature of indigenous disadvantage means there is no simple fix. However, we can fly to the moon. We can make cars that drive by themselves through incredibly complex environments. Complexity is not an excuse for complacency. There's a similar story with respect to gender economics, including the gender pay gap and the gender superannuation gap, two things I've spent a lot of time working on recently. We know what the problems are, but we keep fiddling at the edges, expecting the market to fix it. So steeped are we in the worship of economics that we dare not tell the truth. The system is broken and only profound political intervention can fix it. The obvious place to start in addressing inequality is at the bottom. To me, this means giving homeless people homes. It means giving jobless people jobs, or at the very least, lifting the dole to a level that people can actually live on. We are one of the richest countries in the world at the richest time in human history. Let that sink in for a minute. One of the richest countries in the world at the richest time in human history. We could go to people in remote indigenous communities and ask them what they want for their communities. And then we could provide them with the resources, the training and the jobs to do those things. How's that for a radical idea? Today, I've worn my economist hat, I've worn my historian hat, and I've worn my social theorist hat. Now I'm gonna wear my philosopher hat. 
I cringe a little bit every time I call myself a philosopher because in our society it's only you know very slightly removed from calling yourself a wanker. <laughs> we have anti-intellectualism in this country in fact across the Anglosphere that somebody who calls themselves a lover of wisdom is a wanker. What other discipline though than philosophy is really suited to addressing this issue of inequality. Ultimately, the modern inequality question is this. How much of our nation's economic output should go to the workers? How much should go to the owners of capital? And how much to those who fall through the cracks? There is no mathematical formula or economic model that can answer that question. It's a moral question that is in practice answered by the outcome of a contest of power. Those who don't understand that, at least implicitly, have already lost the contest. In the end though, if you want an explanation of inequality, look no further than those words of Warren Buffett's. There is a class war, and my side is winning. Thank you.